ministry wife is a role without a job description. And let's be honest, sometimes it seems like ministry might be easier if we did have one. If you are a ministry wife and are looking for hope, perspective, and a little bit of practical advice regarding your role, you're in the right place. Hi, I'm Christine Hoover, and I am also a pastor's wife, and I want to welcome you to the Ministry Wives podcast, a production of the North American Mission Board. Join me as we hear from women from various ministry contexts having authentic conversations about our shared joys and challenges, even the ones we're unsure we can talk about out loud. No topic is off limits. Today, my guest is Linda Yang. Linda is an employment specialist with World Relief Chicagoland. Most recently, she has helped newly resettled Afghan refugees in Chicagoland find meaningful work and develop the necessary vocational experience to create a sustainable life in America. Linda has mentored and coached many leaders in local church ministry, including pastors and church planter spouses. Her area of specialty is helping everyday Christians engage their neighbors in mercy ministries and evangelism. Daniel and Linda have helped to plant churches in Detroit, Toronto, and Chicago. They are also parents to five children whose ages range from 21 to 3. In her spare time, which I don't know when she has that, but she loves coffee dates with ladies talking about their identity in Christ and what they can do as God's daughter. So here, friends, is my conversation with Linda Yang. Linda, thanks so much for joining me today for the Ministry Wives podcast. Yeah, thanks for having me, Christine. I am really excited to get to hear your story because you you and your husband, y'all have experience with planting churches. <laughs> I don't know if you would call it experience. <laughs> yeah. Well, you've done it several times. Okay. Where all have you planted a church? Well, you know, we... Really, I, I, I would I would say the only place I would take credit is the one in Toronto. <laughs> okay, but we have helped with uh, you know our, some of our uh, the Detroit the church plant and been to Toronto. We have been to m- multiple places in uh-huh. regards to learning about church plant and being a part of a team here and there. So we yeah. have been around. <laughs> And now you're you've landed in Chicago. Is there a difference? I hear people saying Chicago and Chicago Land. I don't know what Chicago Land means. Uh, I this is my assumption. My assumption is Chicago ref, is really referencing the city Chicago. Chicago Land is a nicer way of trying to reference everywhere else besides the city. So including all the suburbs around Chicago, just so that us suburbans won't feel so left out. <laughs> yeah, yeah. And how long have y'all been there? We've been here. Come July, we'll be here for five years. Okay, Mm -hmm. five years. Mm -hmm. And are you reaching a specific group of people, a neighborhood? What is your goal there? Yeah, that's that's a very good question. Our goal is to reach everyone, actually. (laughs) (laughs) Um, You know, well, when we started the Prodigal Network, our goal is to really reach the multi multi ethnic generation group of Chicago land. And so that's the goal of the Prodigal Network. But for me in particular, and with the group that I'm a part of, our goal is really to to really reach our neighbors in our community and the relationships that we have that God has steward to us. That's that's our goal and our hope is to reach them. Mm-hmm. And I imagine when you say a neighborhood in Chicago, I imagine it to be a very diverse group of people. Mm-hmm. Yeah, in in Chicago and even in in the suburbs, in the area and the community that neighborhood that we live. So, like where we live right now, it's consistently mostly a Hispanic population. And so it's been so fun being here and being among them and uh-huh. yeah. <laughs> uh-huh. Do you speak Spanish? No, I don't. I'm learning. <laughs> oh, good for you. Spanish, yeah, Hispanic population and large amount of refugees has settled oh. around my neighborhood. Yeah. What a wonderful place to mm-hmm. live. That it's been really fun. Exciting. Well, you mentioned the Prodigal Network. Mm-hmm. Can you explain what that is and how are you involved in, in the ministry? Yeah. So the Prodigal Network started with a few of our couple of friends that just had an unsettling spirit of not knowing why we're here in Chicago land and trying to figure out if God had more for us here. Because moving here five years ago and visiting churches, trying to find the right church, 
it was a lot difficult than more than I had imagined. And so we could not uh, figure out what the problem was. <laughs> and we're like, we love church and we're leaders in church. And why is it so hard for us to find a church that we would love? So we all decided to get together and pray about, about this unsettling spirit. And so by February of 2020, we decided, let's do this. Let's start something new in Chicago, so that in Chicago land, so that we can see God's plan come to fruition here. And this is with a um, uh, majority of the folks that was on our team were among Americans. So Dan and I started a church in Toronto with other ethnic groups. And so when we came back, we wanted to do another church with a Hmong American uh, group of folks. So we was like, let's do this with them and see how and what God would do with uh-huh. uh, a Southeast Asian group such uh-huh. as ours here in Chicagoland. So we started and the pandemic came. <laughs> uh-huh. <laughs> and... and uh, <laughs> But we moved forward and ended up, you know, opening our first core launch night on, in June. And so that's been fun. And our hope is to really reach a multi-ethnic next generation uh, group here in Chicagoland and our neighbors um, in our community. And so um, we, the Prodigal Network consists of missional communities that gathers weekly um, daily, however often their rhythm of life is like, but then we meet and we have a corporate gathering that meets once monthly. Okay. Okay. Yeah. Well, I definitely want to ask more about that, but I want to stop and just ask you briefly about, I'm not going to say it right, but I'm just going to try. Among Americans, mm-hmm. I'm not saying that because you said it with less H. Yes. Less H. Yep. It's the H is somewhat silent. It's Hmong. So mm-hmm. yep. Hmong. Okay. And that's H M O N G, and that's uh-huh. my ethnicity. And and we, I mean, I'm thinking this is correct that Suni Lee, the gold medalist, yes, genius. okay, yes, so you got it. <laughs> I I learned it. Yeah, I mean, I remember they on the Olympics they did a little story about. Mong and Mary. Yeah, she put us on the map for sure. She did. She did. (laughs) Well, tell us just real briefly what are some distinct distinctives of your culture? Um, Some distinctives about our culture. Uh, Well, I mean, we're we're known to be a group of people that owns no land, and so we don't claim or have a land of our own that we can call as home. The land and properties that we do get are the the lands that aren't wanted. And so a lot of Hmong, Hmong are pushed to the mountains. Our ancestors came from China, and they lived in the mountains of China. And a lot of them migrated down to, to Vietnam and then further down to Laos and ended up in Thailand. So that's, that's where my parents are from, Laos. They're the group that ended up in Laos. Okay. And then when the Vietnam War hit, we ended up in Thailand at a refugee camp, my parents. Um, And so from there, they ended up here in America, and I was born in Kentucky, (laughs) of all places. (laughs) Is there a large population of Hmong Americans? There is a large group, in normally in Minnesota and in in the West Coast in California. About, I want to say, there's probably about... In the U.S., maybe up to like seven, eight hundred thousand. Oh wow! Not not significantly big, but a good size. Yeah, yeah, that's a good number. yeah. But we're known for just you know the hospitality spirit, warmth, and you know loving friendships and friends, making new friends, all of that. Mm-hmm. Um, so great. But yeah, known for not having anything, but being able to make anything, turn anything to something. I love it. Well, and what you're saying just fits so perfectly with what you're doing, <laughs> what you just described, because you're you're doing missional communities, which mm-hmm. we need to stop and define that. Yeah. How, how do you define or what kind of help us understand the missional community model? Yeah. So like missional community is basically a group 
that is faithfully present among specific people with the intention of making new disciples of Jesus. So in essence, this group of people become a close-knit spiritual family on mission together. Mm-hmm. And so wherever God has called us to make relationship, we all have that commonality of like, oh, you know what? It's this neighborhood that we are, our hearts are drawn to. So we will invest fully into making relationships and being present in this neighborhood and getting to know folks, doing whatever we need to meet the needs there. Uh huh. And then you said you gather once a month, all the missional communities come together. For yeah, worship, yeah, that's, yeah, that's the plan is that we would gather once a month for corporate gatherings, for corporate worship of just reminding one another again of our mission and our call to be on mission with Jesus. And then we just recently added another gathering, which is every other week now, to be a time of equipping, equipping the groups Mm, to know how to be missional, to know how to reach and be intentional in our relationships. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So can you help us give us a picture, paint a picture for us of what your missional community looks like and what do you do anything you can tell us about. Yes. So um, my missional community consists of four four families. We live in close proximity to one another, probably like a five, 10 minutes drive from one another. And so they have come alongside of us, our family, to really make a presence here in our neighborhood and just loving our neighbors and befriending the friends and the relationships that we have here. I've called on, we have we utilize our group to help us put events together. Uh, last year, we did a neighborhood Easter egg hunt, and they came and helped us put that together. We thought we were doing it for, we were planning on doing it for our 40 kids, given that we we only have you know four families putting this together. And on that day, we had like 90 kids show up for this wow. Easter event. It was crazy, beautiful, and we loved how God worked that day. We were able to just share Christ, His resurrection, and celebrate it, His resurrection, and had fun with a simple Easter egg hunt, you know, for the neighbors, neighborhood kids, and the parents loved it. And, you know, given this was during the pandemic still. And so we all needed to have that interaction with others. So, so many parents came up to us to just thank us for hosting this little event for the kids there. And so it was a lot of fun. Yeah. So that's one thing we've done as a missional group here in my neighborhood. We've also had a book club one time where a few of the ladies that wanted to learn more English and practice their English, they came out to join this little book club that we did. And we we used Rick Warren stuff, read through the Purpose Driven Life book. <laughs> Uh-huh. <laughs> and they came and uh, our some of the ladies in my group came and we just hung out with them, did life with them the few weeks that we had together. So those were the things that we get to do together to build on the relationships that we have and to know that I don't have to m- make those relationships by myself. But if my group would come and make those relationships with me and they become friends with, you know, my sisters here in this group, then we're all connected, right? Yeah. yeah. I do like that so much. What you're describing is we, I think a lot of times we think of making disciples as an individual endeavor Mm -hmm. and that we're trying to, if we think of it like a weight that we're trying to hold this weight by ourselves, but, but really we're made to do it together so that we can share the weight of it. And there's more voices, more connections, more opportunities for conversation and relationships yes. when we do it together. Oh, yes, Christine. And just think of it this way. It's like, would you rather fish with a fishing pole or with a net? You catch more with a net, you know, mm-hmm. and to have more than one person being together, holding, locking hands together. We become a big net and we catch more. <laughs> I love it. Mm-hmm. Well, surely though there are challenges to a, a missional community. I'm I'm just thinking, okay, somebody moves to sh- Chicagoland and they're looking for a church, and this is 
this is a little bit different. You, you don't meet every week and you know, the typical models that we're used to, that could be a challenge or I guess an obstacle for some people. So are there challenges that you have come up against through doing this missional community model? Yeah, there is. Uh, One of the major challenges that I see we face all the time and even myself is getting out of that traditional model mindset Mm -hmm. is really difficult. We know that this missional living is the way to live and to, to make God present in this way. And it's so effective if we were to be more missional minded and live life showing God's presence every day with, with our relationship. But man, it's so inconvenient <laughs> when you know that, wow, my life is a display of God all the time with every relationship that he's steward to me. It's my responsibility to show Christ in the and and so it, it takes a toll on you sometimes when you're like, Whoa, I, I have to reach out to them. Oh, I have to like include them. I have to remember and so that's the challenge is to know that this is just not a set time that you do, it's it's how you live, you know, versus the traditional you get away a lot of the time with, okay, we do our Sunday thing, we may do our Wednesday thing, and that's it. We have a lot of our we have downtime to just be by ourselves or do our own thing, right? So that's the challenge I would say that I face and I see it among our group, like, oh, okay, we got to do this. <laughs> uh-huh. Well, and even for women who are listening who are not doing this model, but they're church planting, mm-hmm. and, but they've come from an established church, I think there's can sometimes be that feeling of, oh gosh, this is this is all encompassing of yes. my life. Yeah. And, but there can be, there can be lessons and joys in that if we embrace it. Right. And so I'd love to hear you talk about, you've, you've already told us that it's caused you sometimes to go, Oh, okay. I have to sacrifice here. But what have you learned through this about yourself? How has God grown you hmm. by doing this? Wow. You know, one thing that I've learned is, just learn to be a friend and taking a, like learning that sometimes most time being a friend, a genuine friend to somebody with no hidden agenda is really what God's calling me to do. (laughs) Just to be a friend. I've learned that, wow, I I need to see that more. And I don't see that enough uh, that my friendship offers a lot of opportunities for God to show up. And so that's one thing I've taken away from this in that through the simple acts of kindness, of loving someone through my baked goods, is really all that God needs to open up their hearts to me. He uses my cookies to open the heart of these women. And, you know, they're so quick to want to share something personal with me. They just need the avenue of feeling connected to somebody that seemed like they care. (laughs) And I've learned that when you simplify things and when you just learn to be friends with somebody, God works mightily in that. Mm, That's so good. Well, I want to switch gears just a Mm -hmm. little bit because you have six kids. Is that right? I have five. Five kids. (laughs) Yes. I gave you an extra kid. Yeah. Five kids. And you also work outside the home. Yeah. Is it full time? It is. Okay. Yeah. Full time. And then you're serving in this missional community that yeah. I didn't even ask, but your husband, does he lead <laughs> in a formal capacity um, within the church or the prodigal network? He, um, you know, Dana, Daniel and I, my husband, we lead in a way, we're trying to lead in a way of like um, providing mentorship and guidance and uh, mostly, but at the same time really working and serving and doing everything else with the team. And so uh, we're trying not to hold any titles and there's no title given to anyone. Everyone has equal, equal leadership in this leadership team. And there, there are uh, uh, three other couples with us. 
And so they're all younger than us. And so that's why it, it's we're looked at as, okay, where we want to mentor them and guide them through this process uh-huh. of um, starting this missional community church plant. Uh huh. So my question is uh, more about you and what you do. So we said five kids, yes. working full time, serving in the missional community, mentoring these other couples. Uh-huh. That's a lot on your plate. So, and you know what? There's a lot of women listening who are doing the same. They're working full time. They have children. They're serving as a pastor's wife and yeah. a ministry wife in some capacity. So can you tell us how are you doing that? Like speak for the, the full-time working woman mm-hmm. who's thinking, how am I going to do all of this? Yeah. You know, God, <laughs> his spirit, <laughs> Holy Spirit's leading. And, and the things that I do is, is really being obedient in the moment when God shows up in my heart with a prompting to reach out to somebody or to do this act of, of kindness to, for somebody. And that's how my pace have been since I started working. And I've only been working for four months. And so trying to find that balance, I'm still trying to find that rhythm Uh in my life of adding and juggling another ball. And so I'm trying real hard to pay attention to his promptings a lot of the time to make sure that I am still keeping so-and-so in mind and I'm reaching out to them. Mm -hmm. And it's normally during my quiet time that he'll whisper names. And so my time split between God and doing, doing work. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, yeah, Yeah. yeah. Working at the same time on my phone, reaching out to people. But really, I think if you, you pay attention to God's voice, he'll lead you to know what to do in the moment. You can't do all, but you'll Uh do the right things. Uh huh. So what are your pockets of time where you tend to reach out to people? Mm -hmm. Yeah. The people you just described. Yeah. My pockets of time of reaching out is my early morning times as I'm spending time with the Lord. If they pop up in my head because of a scripture reading or a prayer, that's when I reach out. And even lunch breaks or what have you. What If I'm thinking of somebody, I have to act in the moment of reaching out to them, scheduling something in with them in that moment, or else I, I wouldn't get to it. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> I would imagine a lot of the women in your neighborhood probably work full time as well. Some of them do. And then some of them are home. So it was easier to connect with them and hang out when I was home with the kids. (laughs) I think a lot of times we think, oh, pastor's wives, we think the mold is she doesn't work. But working gives us so much opportunity to connect with people in the world, to know what people are dealing with, what they're thinking. Oh, my goodness. It sure does. Christine, I feel like I feel like God is just blessing me and expanding my boundaries because he's saying, "Okay, you've 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 done your work here in the neighborhood. I'm going to expand your boundaries. And the neat thing is, Christine, I started working at War Relief and God like expanded my boundaries to include the refugee community that lives in my neighborhood. And so to find out where they live geographically just threw me off. I was like, wow, I was so surprised that I now have direct access into their community to, wow. yeah, to get to know them, to, to really know my neighborhood well that I have the opportunity now. And so mm-hmm. it gives you another layer. He gives you another layer of friendship and relationship to to include. Mm-hmm. But um, he's, he's, yeah, he's all, always growing that, those relationships and expanding those mm-hmm. boundaries. If you let him, he will do it. Yes. And it, it seems like you're really passionate about mercy ministries, what we would term mercy ministries, meeting physical needs. And I'm wondering, first of all, Your parents were refugees. Mm -hmm. So I'm wondering if that experience has kind of marked you, even though you didn't experience it, your family did. Mm -hmm. Did that give you, have you just always had a a deep compassion for refugees? Oh, of course. It's a part of my upbringing and my, my life experiences to be in, to grow up in a refugee home and having your parents dependent on you for everything, you know, translation to reading a document for them, to making that phone call and asking the questions that they can't ask and explaining it to them. And so that was just how life was. And so jumping on and, and with War Relief was 
it was normal and it felt comfortable for me to uh-huh. be a part of and to do because I, I did it all all throughout my life growing up, right? So which mm-hmm. which we didn't say that is your job. Yeah. <laughs> People are like, what? World Relief? That is the that job. That is the job. That, yes, that is the job that I just took on not too long ago. Yeah, uh-huh. I've only been on for four months with World Relief, and it's been so fun to be able to contribute in that way and to know how to meet refugees' needs and know where they're at and to know how to encourage them, you know, when they're in a hopeless situation of just arriving here not knowing anything and to say, hey, I was in that. My parents were in that situation, and look at us now have hope. Yeah. Yeah. That's so cool. I Mm -hmm. love that how God uses our stories. Yeah. A story that really you didn't, you experienced it in the second generation, uh, but it's, he implants things in us that we can then, you know, it's a part of our story and we have compassion for people. Yes. I'm wondering as you're living in this missional community, how do you help other people kind of catch that vision? Whether it's mentoring these other leaders, or it's just somebody who's coming to your Mm -hmm. missional community, how do you incorporate them and help them kind of, kind of have that light bulb moment? Mm -hmm. You know, leading them to having that moment has been more of a a process of, hey, I don't know what I'm doing, but God's calling me to do this. Can you venture into this with, with me, with us, and just really walk alongside with me to be obedient to whatever God is leading me to do. And so um, really allowing them to follow alongside me and my obedience to what God is calling me to do has led them into their own obedience of what God has asked them to do. So I think as they see and walk alongside what it looks like to be obedient and to see God work in that obedience, that builds up not just my faith, but their faith. And it, it's a ripple effect where it, yeah. it just continues to um, get bigger of wanting to grow in our relationship with God because we want to be useful. We want to be that tool that he can use wherever we're at, right? And so I think having them do it with you and learn to see God work in our obedience is the key to leading them to follow after God's own promptings mm-hmm. on their heart. Yeah, it's really, it's very energizing. Mm -hmm. When I've been invited into something, see God moving, it makes me want to do that too. Yeah. So I'm just a final question. I'm kind of thinking of the woman that you described, or you described the traditional kind of mindset. And maybe there's a pastor's wife listening who she serves in a traditional church, an established church, uh, or maybe that she's in church planting. Um, but they're, you know, doing the traditional model, but she's really intrigued by what you're saying and thinking, you know what? I do want to live among my neighbors. I do want to build relationships with my neighbors, like what Linda's talking about. What would be the first thing that you would say, you know, here's, here's the first thing that you should do Uh, after praying, after, after following the Lord and, and asking for his voice, but what, what are some hints or maybe some, some wisdom that you would share with her? Hmm. <laughs> uh, I'd say uh, just take that first step to meeting that neighbor going next door with a baked good. <laughs> 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 Meet the physical need of someone and you can get into their hearts. <laughs> but meet that physical need. And once it's met a couple of times, I promise you, you will no longer, the, the, the third time, you will no longer be standing at their front door, but you'll be invited into their home to get to know them and their stories. And when you see God opening doors and you see the vulnerability of how of them sharing their life with you and how God can really need to use you in that moment, you can't not do it again. It's Mm -hmm. so like powerful to see God open hearts in front of you and say, wow, here, you know, I called you to this person and she's like, she's just downloaded everything to you of what she needs help with or what her situation is. Mm-hmm. And you cannot continue to live that way when you see the need out there and you see that you think they have people to go to. You think they have strong communities to support them, but honestly, they don't. And they need you to be that for them. 
Mm, Mm -hmm. That's such a good word. And I think especially after the pandemic, kind of coming out of the pandemic, I think a lot of people are very desirous for some sort of connection. And so we as believers have such an opportunity. And what you're saying to us is it's not as complicated as we tend to make it. It's as simple as baking cookies and going across the street. Oh, yeah, definitely. That's my secret power there is, hey, I'm coming over with some bread because I had too many bananas. (laughs) So So you you bake bread. That's your thing. Oh, yeah, that's my thing. I would make my banana bread and my excuse is I just had too many. So I made extra and I wanted to give you some. And and yeah, I just I'm just amazed to see how simple that is, but how effective that is. <laughs> wow. Yeah. But then also learning that I had to learn that I, I I was doing these things not because of a role I held at church or because I'm a pastor's wife. And I had to wrestle with it at the beginning because I would do it. And, you know, when we moved here, I didn't have a role. I, we didn't have a church. We were looking for churches, but I wanted to do something. So I went out and met neighbors with these cookies and banana bread. And I felt awkward at first because I didn't have an, a title that I came, you know, in. and I, I remember the Lord, like just speaking to me in that moment saying, Linda, you're not doing this because you hold a position or you're in this ministry, but you're doing this because you're my daughter and this is my business. And the things I've put in your heart to do is because I put those desires in your heart to do it. So you do it on behalf of me as my, you know, my daughter. So I, I when I heard that, I said, okay, you're right, God. <laughs> it's so, you forget sometimes when you're, you've been in ministry for so long that I'm doing this because I am his daughter, God's daughter, doing on the, on behalf of that title. Yes. Mm-hmm. That is so good and such a great place to end. I'm really, really thankful for you, Linda, and what you and your husband are doing there in Chicago land. And I'm thankful that you spent this time with me just sharing about your life and sharing these insights that you've learned. So thanks for joining. Oh, I so enjoyed it. Thank you, Christine, for asking me to be a part of this. Thank you. Thanks so much for listening to the Ministry Wives podcast, a production of the North American Mission Board. If you found this content helpful, please subscribe, rate, and review us on your podcast platform or share it with a friend. You can find this podcast and other helpful resources at ministrywivespodcast.com.